When we go back to the first rule of sales, the first rule of sales says get somebody to like you, right? What should it be? That's right. Find things in others that you find likable. Find things in others that you share and have in common that you like. And by coming to like another person, we'll get to this as the amplifier of liking in a, in a few minutes. It, liking is up to you. You know, it, what an insecure position to work from when you're trying to get people to like you. You know, what should I do? Should I dance? Should I, <laughs> you know, what sh how should I change myself to be liked by you? That's a bad position to be in. It's an insecure position to be in. Finding things in others that you genuinely like that you have in common can turn that relationship around, can form a relationship that's based on some genuine feature of what you both share. You know, so many people when they get into a meeting, you know, they're going into a negotiation, you see them do something like this, you know, they're, they're going and, oh God, I gotta go in and, hi, how are all you doing? Have you noticed some people do that sometimes? Maybe even you've had to do that because it's just, it's just not something you want to face. You know, and one of the things that this is talking, this is implying is that we need to go in with our genuine selves. We've got to be prepared for the meetings that we go in and find those points of intersection that we can bring up that make these kinds of interactions far more pleasant, not only for us, but the people that we're uh, interacting with, negotiating with. Praise is the second activator. People like people who f say nice things about them. Joe Girard's the great example of that. Anybody know who Joe Girard is? Anybody read that book? Mark, uh, who is he? World's greatest salesman. World's greatest salesman. He's born and raised in Detroit, right, from poverty essentially, and he was out of a job, eventually got a job as a salesperson, begged his way into a job. Uh, and, and he got into that job. And how many cars and trucks do most salespeople in the auto business sell every day, or every week, let's say. One or two a week. They sell one or two a week. Joel sold, on average, during his active years of being a car salesman, I think about 15 years, sold an average of six or seven cars and trucks every day. Every day. Every day. Think about that. Um, and, you know, when asked what the secret of success is, he said, I, I love people. I like people. I, you know, I, he had 13,000 customers. 13,000 customers. And every month he'd send a card to every one of those 13,000 customers. And if it was, for instance, um, um, November, he'd send a card out. I hope you have a happy Halloween. I like you, Joe Girard. If it was January, have a happy new year. I like you, Joe Girard. Send a card out like that every month to these 13,000 people. Now, um, Joe Girard's customers, when they went to buy a car for him, didn't just show up at the doorstop. What they had to do is they, they made appointments to buy a car from Joe Girard. They couldn't just walk in because so many people wanted to buy a car from Joe Girard, and he wanted to make sure he gave, <coughs> gave excuse me, <coughs> gave him the best service. Uh, in this 2006 interview he did for uh, Harvard Business Review, um, here, here's what he had to say. He said, when they asked him, how, how do you account for your success? When you bought a car from, you, me, from me, you didn't just get a car, you got me. I would break my back to service a customer. I'd rather service a customer than sell another car. After a few years, there was pandemonium outside my office. There were so many people waiting to see me. So I started seeing people by appointment only. And the reason people were willing to wait a week for an appointment rather than go buy from someone else right away is because they knew if they got a lemon, I would turn it uh, into a peach. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about the fact that he, when his customers came in with problems with their car, he'd get them to be one of the first ones into the service department, turn them around in 20, 30 minutes and have them out. How many of you'd like to buy a car from a guy like this? Right? He liked his customers. He praised his customers. He really uh, embodied this principle of liking. Now, 
Uh, you notice up there we have this statement, people are highly susceptible to flattery, even false flattery. We ask people, you know, what do you think about flattery versus false flattery? When you discover that somebody is just ingratiating themselves to you, when they're just, you know, my, you look nice today and you know you don't. <laughs> you know, what do you think about that person? Do you like them? And people say no, but that's not true. That's not what the research shows. This is one of the only areas in the research when found to be false. Flattery is just as, uh, false flattery is just as powerful in inducing liking is, as is genuine flattery. Just as, just as powerful in inducing liking. But now I want to ask you this question. Um, what's the downside? If, and it's by the way, one of the only findings in the social sciences when discovered to be false has no impact on the dimension under study. But what does it have an impact on? Credibility. Credibility. That's right. Now, you know, maybe you're the person who receives that false flattery, and maybe you even believe it. <laughs> but think about the other people around you who hear it as well. What do they think about the communicator? And what do they think about the credibility of that person? You know, so even if you believe it, and even if you like that person, the, the, the credibility, the authority then, this is dealing with the principle of authority, is diminished. And of course, one of the things that we know from the research is the single most important feature of a communicator is their credibility. So um, there's another issue that comes up with respect to praise. And here's something to think about. Um, it's great when you praise somebody to their face. It's great when you tell them how great they're doing. But often you're not the most powerful communicator of a message. Other people are. And so when the opportunity arises for you to um, be able to talk to other people about the praiseworthy things that somebody has done, um, Talk nicely behind a person's back. How many of you say it's kind of nice to hear somebody come up to you and say, I heard from your boss that you're really doing an outstanding job. Now that's a credible communication, right? You, you're out there and, and talking to other people about it. You're not just trying to ingratiate yourself to, uh, to this individual. You're, you, you really do genuinely believe in the good work that this individual is doing and you're willing to go out online and tell others about it. So when possible, um, communicate praise through others. You remember this standard environmental uh, appeal? You know, do it because the environment deserves our respect. With many others, this is how it was changed. In a study conducted in the fall of 2003, this was now in the spring of 2004, 75% of the guests participated in our new resource savings program by using their towels more than once. You can join your fellow guests in this program to help save the environment by reusing your towels during your stay. 75%, good. Many similar others, in addition to saying in a study conducted in the fall of 2003, 75% of the guests who stayed in this room, room, and then it was handwritten in, in this case, room 321, participated in our new resource savings program, etc. What happened? Well, this is a separate study in the environmental only appeal. About 37% reuse their towels. When it comes to 75% of the guests who stayed in this hotel, 44% of those exposed to that information reuse their towels during their stay. And when we talk about 75%, of the guests who stayed in this room, room 321, 49.3% of those individuals reuse their towels. Again, almost a uh, little over, just about 30% more than in the environmental only appeal. And, and, and this is kind of amazing, isn't it? The people who stayed in this room, now, you would probably be hoping that they didn't reuse the same towel. <laughs> Can I ask you an ethical question? Sure. Was that legitimate, or did they just change the verbiage hoping to get a different response? 
Seventy-five percent of the people in that hotel. Well, by on the average, then seventy-five percent of the people who stayed in any of the rooms in the hotel reuse that. So that was kind of the way. Remember, this is an experiment where we're trying to control in. The seventy-five percent of the guests did reuse their towels, and so that applied or distributed across all those rooms. Um, but th th that's an interesting thing as well. So remember what I talked about that nominal group paradigm, the minimal group paradigm, just being a person who stayed in this room, you know, just that itself had a significant boost on the number of people reusing their towels. And the amazing thing is, if you go around the country, th this study has been talked about now for a few years, how many of you have ever seen anything that talks about what other guests in the hotel have done? We haven't seen it in any major hotel chain anywhere. Uh, in, in fact, where that tool is available, where they have that information, wouldn't it be good for those hotels to raise that to the surface, to be able to really augment the um, savings that they're getting for the hotel and hopefully passing on to their guests. So here's a key. Once you've collected uh, testimonials and information from someone, what do you want to do with that testimony? Do you want to talk about here's what our best customers are doing, here's what our top customers are doing, or people just like you? You know, if you're trying to talk to somebody who's in a medium-sized business, use, use testimonials and data from a medium-sized business. If it's a, if it's a big business, use the examples of the big, uh, the, the big business. Most people like to use their best testimonials the ones that represent the most um, notable clients or customers they have independent of how similar they are. This evidence shows us that we should be using a little bit more discretion in how we transmit the information and who is the group that we're... So let's think about uh, some things that consensus is admonishing us to do. First, focus on the behavior you want from others, not the behavior you don't want. I didn't quite mention that explicitly, but you know, there's a, a county attorney here in the state of Arizona who um, uh, about a year or two ago wanted to reduce the number of teenage pregnancies, and so he came out with an ad something, saying something like this. Um, several thousand, I forgot the number that he used, teenage uh, girls become pregnant in Arizona every month. Essentially, don't you be one of them. What happened as a result of that kind of messaging? That's right, we find teenage pregnancies going up. You know, don't talk about the behavior you don't want from others. Focus on the behaviors uh, that you do want. Share with others what other companies or other people are doing, uh, especially uh, thought leaders, especially opinion leaders in an area, uh, to help them make better decisions about how they ought to progress. So there's been some research in the medical literature where opinion leaders leading seminars on um, different medical procedures versus uh, trained trainers uh, from the pharmaceutical companies leading them, we find uh, changes in behaviors as much as 40 times the, uh, the change in behavior by those led by opinion leaders as opposed to those that are led by uh, seminar trainers that um, come from the pharmaceutical industry. Finally, get others, especially vocal advocates and opinion leaders, to transmit your ideas. You know, just as in liking, you're probably not, it's good when you praise somebody to their face, but it's even more powerful when it comes from other sources here too. Instead of you persuading another individual, get somebody who is an opinion leader, an advocate, to transmit that message instead of you. They're a more unbiased source of information. 